Well, good day, mates. Coming to you from Queensland, Australia. And we're out on a cattle station that is about 28,000 hectares, which is the equivalent of approximately 60,000 acres, a little more. And so we're going to poke around here on this cattle ranch. We'll look at the cattle, look at the grass, get some new ideas, share some ideas. But isn't that beautiful? This is Mount Mulligan. And I'll put a map up so you can see where we're at. And we're down here visiting our son and his wife for a few days and thought that we'd do the thing that we do when we're tourists, and that is go visit a ranch. What better thing to do than enjoy nature and enjoy God's creation. So stay with us and let's see what we can uncover here. So I wanted to show you where we were. We are in the northeast part of Australia in Queensland and the blue dot is where Mount Mulligan is. And as we get closer you can see again the blue dot is Mount Mulligan which was the cattle station we were on. And then Cairns is the coastal city that we flew into and then drove by car to Mount Mulligan. Mount Mulligan Ranch sits at the base of Mount Mulligan, which is this long mountain range that you can see. And the ranch headquarters is just to the east of this mountain range. The mountain range itself is owned by the Aboriginal people, the indigenous people that were in the country prior to the Europeans coming over. The ranch itself extends mostly east and south of the Mount Mulligan mountain range. Got a gentle rolling topography, lots of oaks and other trees. They allowed us to tour the ranch in Kubota side by sides and we were able to go out and view the country and look at the grass. We were just coming out of a very intense rainy season. Apparently they had some massive rains that had ended just several weeks before we got there. And the road to the ranch was impassable and the staff that ran the ranch were unable to get out of the ranch by car for about three weeks. And so in and out, uh, of the ranch was only accomplished by helicopter at that point in time. Um, I assume they had stockpiled necessities prior to the rainy season. But this is the typical topography of the ranch and it went on for miles and miles and miles with these uh, different species of trees. You can see the good grass cover. Um, this is a ranch that ran about 2,500 head of cows. And periodically, as we were driving, we would run across a different group of cattle. So one of the first groups we came across was this group here, obviously all Brahma. Um, we saw some, what I thought were Brahma crosses and some different other groups, and these cattle they moved like sheep, interestingly. When they were moving um, through the pasture, they were single file and it was long lines of these cattle moving. Here they've come to a mineral feeder and um, they're just kind of hanging out, getting some mineral. As you can see, we got some horned cattle, mostly pulled cattle. We've got some cattle that are in not great shape. And then we've got cattle that are in really good shape. This is not far away from the group we just saw and you can see these are mature mama cows they've definitely got the brahma influence um, reds and grays and brindle colors and 
the whole deal. And again, this is a what they call a ranch, or what we call a ranch here in the States is called a cattle station in Australia. And so as we drove, we'd just run across these groups of cattle. Um, that one doesn't have much of a hump on her. Um, looks more like an English breed of sorts, except for the ear. This looks a little bit more like an English breed. Very little hump, if any. So I don't know, didn't, wasn't able to talk to anybody that knew um, anything about the particular breeds of cattle, but, but again, as you can see in this um, shot here, mostly Brahma influenced cattle. Um, I think they, the thinking is they're hardier, they do better in this landscape. Um, there's about 25 inches of rainfall a year. And from, again, from what I understand, it, it comes during a short period of time, um, lots of water, and then there's a, a fairly long dry season where the cattle are eating the um, grass that is dormant. It's high nutritive value. This grass cures standing up, and basically they're eating hay that's not rolled or baled. Um, during the rest of the year outside the, the growing season. You can see there's a good looking bull there on the left and um, he's with his little herd. I suppose I suppose most of them are like that in that there's multiple bulls with, with a group of cows running but I don't have confirmation of that. So we would just drive and look around um, really good grass here as you can see on the sides of the road. This was early one morning and the amount of forage was just incredible. Incredible. So this grass coming out of the rainy season um, it cures standing. Um, obviously there's no way to harvest any forage with machinery in this country. It would be an impossible task. Too much too much uh, too many trees and rocks and what have you. That's a look at Mount Mulligan as we were traveling. Um, so this grass cures standing up so it's actually standing hay for the rest of the grazing season during the dry season. And it's, it's quite voluminous um, assuming the cattle do well and it didn't sound to me from what I could gather by talking to the people that were showing us around and they knew absolutely nothing about the cattle into the operation to be honest but from what I could gather they might feed a little bit of hay during part of the year and remember the seasons are different um, we were there in April and and we're just in the middle of springtime here in the states and they were st starting to nudge towards winter time so temperatures were going from hot to cool and um, so they'll they'll go into the winter time and the cattle will be eating this standing forage that's that's dried was drying up quite quite fast meaning going from green to brown so there's a look at Mount Mulligan there um, again, that is Aboriginal land, and no one sh is supposed to be able to go up there without uh, Aboriginal consent, and I don't even know if you can get that. And then we stumbled on to the cattle working pens, and you can see that these are built for Brahma cattle. They are out of heavy-duty, heavy-gauge galvanized metal. Um, very, very stout pins. They, um, this, this set of pins probably could work. I would guess you could hold three to 400 head in here at a time, maybe a little bit more. Um, but a nice set of working pins, tall working pins. I, as you know, Brahma are prone to jump, so they had it set up where, that would uh, they're they're stout enough. These 
these pins and the gates won't bend if a cow hits them. Um, here's a typical gate latch, which was just a chain and a welded piece of metal that had a slot cut out of it for the chain to fit in. Very secure. Um, no way that was going to come open um, in any form or fashion. And then we had a walkway here built up beside the chute so that people could walk along there and I assume vaccinate and deworm and do all the things uh, while they were working the cows. This little covered uh, podium here is interesting. If you notice those pipes, that those long pipes that go down and attach to gates along this alley system, one person could stand up there and as they sorted cattle could put them in the different pens from that position. So I think there's one, two, three, four, maybe five different ways to sort cattle um, just by pulling and pushing those pipes to get them into the right pen. And so you don't have to have a man on horseback. That would probably be a little bit dicey with these the Brahma influence cattle. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five different ways they could sort them. Here's a squeeze chute with a head catch and why it's positioned directly um, behind the the loading chute for the double deck cattle truck tr the double deck cattle trucks I don't know um, but that is in fact the story and you could sort cattle two ways from from that uh, squeeze chute as well as you let them out of the squeeze chute as we meandered around we ran across this group of, of steers and these are two-year-old steers that um, are, have been on the ranch for two years. They're grass-fed, and they will be going to slaughter soon. I was very interested in why they keep their, uh, the steers this long. They don't have very many feedlots, as best I could determine, um, in Australia. Nothing like we have in the U.S., and it sounded to me from the information I could glean from the people on the ranch that these, these steers went directly to the slaughter at around two years of age. So my question was, why not have more cows and send these calves off the ranch when they're weaned instead of keeping them for two years and eat all that extra grass? And I never got a answer that answered the question to my satisfaction, but nevertheless, that seems to be the typical thing in Australia, or at least in this part of Australia, to keep the steers and, and, and grow them out on grass. So they, they also have the grass-fed beef industry down there. This is a typical uh, riverbed. You can see there's still quite a bit of water here. And our guide told us that this will be totally dry in another 60 days or so as they head into the dry season. And it was quite interesting that they, they had, I guess, an abundance of rain this year because the guide kept telling them about how high the water mark was in these, in these riverbeds. So uh, I think we got there at a good time to see some good grass, obviously, towards the end of the, the, or the, at the end of the grazing season, after we, they came out of the dry season, I'm sure we don't have any grass cover at all, um, anywhere like what you're seeing in these pictures. There's my sweet wife, Lori, and we just had a grand time here. Just some more footage um, going up at the base of Mount Mulligan, and again, that is sacred land and uh, from the perspective of belonging to the indigenous aboriginal people and so there's a big uh, it was very obvious that that there's uh, the people are trying to respect their ancestry and the aboriginals uh, and, and what 
they've gone through in that country and there was obviously some horrific things that happened to that group of people and so I think the current Australians are very cognizant of that and trying to make amends as best they can. It's just a beautiful little um, little lake that's at the base of Mount Mulligan. Um, there's water pouring out of that mountain. There must be huge aquifers that uh, are coming out. There's Our kids went up to a swimming hole at the base of a waterfall and it was way up, way up the canyon, so very, very picturesque. Um, they, they took quite a few pictures and it was really, really nice. So this is just a quick thumbnail tour of Mount Mulligan Cattle Station in Queensland, Australia. And if you get a chance, it's a long flight. It's 14 hours from LA to Sydney. You're in the air the whole time tough plight, but we enjoyed it. Thanks.